Have you checked out VanillaSoft? It's a sales engagement platform, but what does that mean, right? Well, it means that you can stop your sales reps from cherry picking leads. It means they'll make more than just two or three contact attempts. It means you could potentially triple your sales pipeline. Check it out at VanillaSoft.com. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am honored and very, very grateful to be joined by this individual. He is a friend of Ten Bound, and we've worked together last year at the conference. And just, I've loved learning from him, and I can't wait to share his knowledge with the audience here on the on the podcast. Joe Venuti, Senior Director of Inside Sales over at Sendoso. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. Very excited to be here and to have this conversation. Yeah, and like I said, big fan of what you, you're you doing, the work over at Sendoso, and want to thank you again for jumping in on the conference last year. That was one of the top-rated panels that we had, and we're still getting feedback on that. So yeah, let's dive in. You know, you've been in the game for a long time, and you've got a ton of experience here. How did you get into inside sales, sales development, and, you know, what brings you to Sendoso now? Yeah, so how I got into sales was probably not a very typical story. Right when I, I grew up in Boston, and right as I finished school, I worked for a contract security company and slowly but surely worked my way up as a manager in that organization. So I was managing like uniform security guard services and like all of the electronic security, executive protection type stuff. So very, very far away from sales. As I grew throughout that organization, they looped me into a couple of on-site sales meetings so I could talk about what an account manager does and the value we bring to these potential clients. We ended up closing a few of those deals that I was involved in, and I fell in love with sales from that experience. Eventually, I left that organization, and my first real sales job was a inside sales rep for by appointment only. I spent about a year on the phones there and then became a team manager. I then went down to Southern Massachusetts, helped them open up and build their office in Norwood, and then made my way out to Arizona and worked for two years in their Mesa office as a manager and spent about a year at Lead Crunch after that. Lead Crunch was kind of the next step for me, moving into like SaaS sales leadership. And then got a call from our CEO, Chris. We had a couple of conversations around Sendoso. I absolutely loved like the mission. I loved the product. It was definitely very, very different from a lot of stuff that's out there and has a great leadership team. So I was, I was fortunate enough to join the team and I've been on board now coming up on two years. Nice. Okay. So yeah, Chris is one of the best, man. I just saw him at the Zant conference last week. He's an amazing guy. So no. Yeah. <laughs> such a, one of the most humble CEOs you'll ever meet, but you couldn't ask for a better guy to lead your company. dude. I mean, I walked around the expo of the conference area and it was kind of slow. They, everybody was in sessions and he was sitting there at the, at the booth, you know, talking to prospects, working on his computer, just hustling, man. So um, great great guy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Through it all, Chris is a sales guy at heart and that's never going to go away. 100%. 100%. So you're working for a sales guy. All right. I like it. <laughs> that's, that's quite and, a big perk. I'll tell you that. And you moved from Boston to Arizona. What was the thought process there? Because my in-laws live in Arizona and I always enjoy visiting there from California. But what brought you out to Arizona? Was it the job or? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, well, a little bit of both, honestly. So there had been some conversations about me transferring to the Mesa office and I was up in the air. Obviously it was a big move. and. Coming out of the snowiest winter in Massachusetts history, after a very, very bad commute home, it took me about nine hours, and I'm not exaggerating, I decided somewhere on Interstate 93 that this Arizona job looked pretty appealing and had a couple of conversations over the next month, and, and here I am. But uh, <laughs> That's but, all but, it took. Yeah, yeah. But the truth is, at its core, it was, it was a good career opportunity for me. There was a lot of room to grow, obviously. The sales industry, the inside sales industry here in Scottsdale was booming. So I knew that it would lead to other career opportunities. And obviously it has. Yeah, it is booming out there. I mean, the tech industry and Sendoso is making big investments. And so I want to, I want to hear you're working, you've got this amazing opportunity, great company, tons of momentum. How do you think about running your inside sales, sales development program? And 
you know, do you report up to sales, marketing? Where should the team report? Yeah. So I currently report into our CMO. When I first started, I reported into sales. As I've worked in sales development, I've I've reported to both sides. My personal feeling on where it should report and where ultimately I think you're going to see it land over the next couple of years is I think it's going to become its, its own standalone department. I don't know that it fits perfectly into sales or marketing. There's components of both there. But I also think that a lot of these organizations have some friction between sales and marketing. And if you get a good, strong sales development leader in place, they can act as the bridge between those two teams and drive a lot more chemistry, right? I think that it's easy for sales teams to say the marketing leads aren't good. It's easy for marketing to say sales can't close. But I think that if you put sales development between those two, And it's its own standalone department. It's going to take everything from marketing, turn it into genuinely good sales leads that ultimately lead to revenue for the company. I think those are going to become like three main pillars in everybody's revenue formula. And I think that you'll see them be like their own separate entity as sales development continues to evolve and grow and just really be that tip of the pipeline sphere. Interesting. Okay. So where do you think that they would report then? Is it it just like... Is there a chief revenue officer or I guess it depends on the size of the company, but do they report directly to the CEO in a smaller company and then maybe a CRO at at a larger one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, potentially, I think that, you know, if you've got a CMO and a CRO in place, you'd probably want your head of sales dev reporting into that same person, right? So all three of those roles are rolling to the same spot. Again, like in smaller organizations, it, it might be a CEO or it could be a, a COO even. And then as you get into like larger organizations, I'm sure it's all going to roll to revenue ultimately to, to a CRO. Got it. Okay. That's really interesting. So completely different department necessarily. It's almost like you have a customer success department at a subscription company, right? And so you would have a distinctive sales development department a sales department, marketing, and then customer success as well. Yeah. I mean, I just think it doesn't fit perfectly into either side, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that look a lot like sales and there's a lot of things that look a lot like marketing. But the fact of the matter is it's a combination of both and it's really become its own entity. Just as sales, especially SaaS sales and tech sales has gotten so competitive. People are leveraging sales development and SDRs more and more. And they're just becoming such an integral part of the space that I think eventually, you know, you'll see more and more VP titles that are solely responsible for all things development and they'll they'll have a seat at that table. Okay. That's interesting because, you know, from a goal perspective, it's appointments set, qualified appointments, and then pipeline generated. And then ultimately how much of that pipeline becomes booked sales. And so would that be the goal of the sales development leader? If they were standalone, would it be pipeline created? Because I think marketing departments are moving in that direction, but there's still a hesitation there to take on a pipeline number because they don't want to necessarily be responsible for something that they don't necessarily control. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I think that Sales development is the side that will own, you know, overall like accepted opportunities into pipeline and the overall pipeline number for the organization, right? I think that it just makes sense. You take your overall, take your overall revenue number and back it up into how many appointments do you need and then back it up into how much pipeline is that. And that's what you tie back to your head of sales now. Right. And then their compensation is tied into nice, nice, steady number on those three. And yeah. and then what if they go back to, they reverse engineer it back and, and they go, you know, our marketing is not supplying me enough or our brand is not well known or, you know, our product market fit. Like, so this leader of sales development would be in charge of having those conversations, basically. Exactly. Right. I think that, again, if they are working in conjunction with your head of sales and your head of marketing, those conversations are a lot easier to have when everyone's on an even playing field, right? I think that you reserve the right to ask for the things that you need from your revenue teammates to make sure that your, you know, your silo is successful inside of that, that revenue machine. I think that sometimes that can be difficult when you have everybody reporting up to the same person, right? So if you put sales development into sales, like maybe that's a tough conversation to have with your VP 
or if you're reporting into marketing, maybe it's a tough conversation to have with your direct manager. But if you have, again, the three silos, three individuals all pulling ultimately for revenue, I think those conversations get easier and there's some mutual accountability, right? I asked for this, this, and this, and now I better produce this, this, and this to come out the other side for sales. And I think another thing is the, just the respect, you know, because, you know, we're preaching to the choir, but it's like, you know, sales development has been seen, I think it's changing. It feels like it's changing in the industry, but it's been seen as this sort of entry level kind of afterthought, like it's a promotion path and stuff like that, where it's in your vision, it's like, it's more strategic and the respect of the leader at the VP level is the same as you would see at the same level in marketing or sales. Yeah, I agree. And I think that there's things you can do within the sales development organization right now to mitigate some of that. So for instance, when I joined the team at Sendoso, I was the first Arizona-based hire. So there was no real sales development team in place. We built everything from scratch. And one of the things that I pushed pretty hard for, and the truth is, was, was a pretty easy sell because it made a lot of sense, was a compensation package for the SDRs where if they hit certain certain milestones, there's levels built in. So they can go from SDR 1 to 2 and SDR 2 to 3. So they're earning more money and they're getting promotions. And as they get these promotions like this celebrated pretty widely throughout the organization and you know the account executives are all aware of what SDRs are making moves and climbing the ladder and those are the ones that are having conversations with our CRO about being you know next in line to move into to an SMB account executive spot. So I think that if you build the comp right and you get a good group of engaged SDRs, they'll take care of earning the respect of the other departments for you. You know, I've really, really tried to hire for the right, the right culture, the right kind of personality, the right kind of like hungry driven SDR. And I think like as a result, the sales development team and function inside of Sendoso is very well respected. I don't think anybody will tell you yeah, it's just an entry level where people spin their wheels for a year and then go get a sales job somewhere else. I've got, I've promoted more people than I've lost out the door in my year and a half plus there. That's amazing. Okay, so setting up that system properly, so aligning it with the comp and making sure that the recruiting is bringing in really top notch people, and then laying out a path for people, and then that respect just naturally grows because you've got a well run program. It sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I think like the other piece for me has been, I've been able to promote top performing SDRs like into leadership positions. And I know that a lot of people feel different ways about like taking your best rep and making them a manager. But in my particular circumstance, there's this two individuals who came in as SDR ones, worked their way up to two and three, and they were displaying leadership qualities already. So it was a kind of the natural next step. It's where their career ambition was. So they now oversee most of my outbound team. But having management in place that is not afraid to roll up their sleeves and really engage with the team and and coach and train and mentor is only going to make the team, you know, much more successful. And it also allows me the ability to hire from places that maybe you don't see a lot of recruiting happening, right? So I think that everyone's looking for that person fresh out of college or, the person who's been an SDR for a year and just wants to move to a better company. I've been fortunate that I've been able to take a lot of career changes, right? I've I've actually hired several people from the service industry. The fear of talking to people, the fear of being instantly likable does does not exist. And that's one of the big hurdles when you're trying to train an SDR, right? Don't be afraid to get on the phone. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody. These folks that I was able to hire out of the service industry, they're already people, people, people. So, um, (laughs) I've had a lot of success there because managers leading this team can do the job as good as anyone that's currently in it. It's a, you know, they're very well versed in training and able to get people ramped up on the tech stack. So I don't spend a ton of time like going over resumes, you know, to the letter. It's really about that conversation I have with them when they come in and if they can basically prove to me they've got a ton of grit and they're really coachable and they're really hungry. We'll, you know, in a lot of cases, we'll end up giving them a shot regardless of what they look like on paper. And I will tell you, some of my top performers, if you just looked at their resume, you may not even brought them in for an in-person interview. This is such a huge, huge point here, Joe, because when you think about the profile, especially here in the Silicon Valley area, it's a very stereotyped profile that you mentioned. You know, it's mm-hmm. 
like raw recruit right out of college, do it for a year and then go get another job. But what you're saying is you're looking for the characteristics of the person, even if it doesn't necessarily fit that stereotypical profile, grit, coachability, hunger, and Mm -hmm. they may not even look on paper like what you stereotypically think of as an SDR. No, absolutely. I mean, because here's the thing at the end of the day, right? Between me and the managers here, I can teach a new employee how to use Salesforce. I can teach a new employee how to use any of the tools in our tech stack. I can teach you how to pitch, how to close, all of that. I can't teach you to care. Like it's the one thing I can't train. So if they bring the hunger and they genuinely want to succeed, I'm confident that between me and the leadership on this team, we'll get them over the top and we'll make them really, really good SDRs. And who knows where their career goes from, from there. Right. But that's that innate ability or it's not an ability. It's, it's like that innate caring for what they're doing and being involved is you can't necessarily teach. You have to find, it seems like. Yeah, okay. exactly. You can't teach passion. Like that's the one thing they have to come with. Got it. Okay. And you know, it's interesting because Sendoso has been so successful over the last few years and you've got, there's some factors that are like not really in your control. You've got a great product market fit, great leadership, stuff like that. But do you feel like the go-to-market engine that you've assembled has a big part of their success? Because you could have all those other factors, but if you don't have a good go-to-market engine, then it sputters. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that the entire go to market team has been built on, you know, several like core values. And the biggest thing that I see at Sendoso, one of the things that I am personally most proud of is every single person is pulling in the same direction. Some days are tougher than others, right? That's just life in a startup. But it's never about why is this broken or why is this not working as well as it should. It's let's get the right five or six people in a room hammer this thing out and just to make it better. And that starts, you know, at the absolute top of this organization with with Chris and the rest of our, the rest of our C-suite. It's never about why are we in this situation? Whose fault is it that this isn't working? It's just collectively, we need to drive revenue. How do we go and do that? Here's the situation we're in, let's just move forward. And I think that has built such a healthy culture from the top down that people are not afraid to make mistakes. People are not afraid of having a bad day or a bad week. They trust the process and they trust the organization and, and they know like collectively we'll get there, right? Some days are some days are easy, some days are tough, some months are easy, some months are tough. But at the end of the day, I think that everyone feels there's a really, really good support system. And even at my level, I, I, I feel that from the people that I report it to. And I, my, one of my biggest things is that I want that to trickle down from me to every SDR on the team. And I think that that is why you've seen a lot of success, right? There's been ups and downs, there's always going to be but we're all pulling in the same direction. There's one common goal at the end of the day. That's revenue and building an amazing brand. Most people refer to VanillaSoft as the solution. It's the solution to ensure sales reps make the right number of attempts for every lead across all channels, including email, social, and the phone. It's the solution to serve the rep the next best lead every single time. You need to get your solution at VanillaSoft.com. That's what you got. It's rolling up your sleeves. You mentioned rolling up your sleeves. And I just picture like going up to Chris and try like in the usual company where it's finger pointing, it's blaming, it's like politics and stuff like that. If you tried with that, I mean, Chris, it seems like he would just have a blank expression on his face and be like, what's the problem? Let's fix it. You know, it's a totally different mindset, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone's just super collaborative. It's not about, you know, again, like, I, I mean, just. It's not about whose fault is it, who made a mistake. It's here's the situation. We need to get from point A to point B. Let's put a plan in place and then make it actionable and go do it. And I I just think that this is such a huge lesson for anybody listening, like in seeing dysfunctional sales development programs or dysfunctional companies, like this kind of gets to the root of it. It's not, it becomes not about finger pointing as much as working together toward a single goal. And so, Joe, I want to ask you just kind of shifting gears from a strategic perspective, as you look at building your pipeline, you know, you had a background in the outsourced SDR industry. How do you think about potentially using these, all these different outsourced companies to augment what you have? Because you've built such a culture 
a high performing culture, it might not even be necessary. But, you know, the reason I ask is as we put together the market map for sales development, there's just like an explosion of all these different outsourced sales development companies. And it's like, how should sales development leaders think about plugging in one of those solutions if there's a piece of the puzzle that's potentially missing, you know? Yeah, I think like any other tool or service out there, there's there's a time and a place. My personal feeling is, especially in the startup world, especially where, you know, your brand is so important, no one's going to quite take care of that as well as you will internally. But I think that when it comes to like outsourcing projects, I think like there's certain like non-core team activities that might be you know, you can kind of A-B test out there on the market with some of these services. I just know, like, for me personally, especially at Sendoso, like, we preach personalization. That is literally what Sendoso is, right? Everything we do is personalized outreach. So it's very, very important to me that all of the outreach is done with some thought behind it. And it is personalized in nature. It is meaningful to the person that's receiving, whether it's an email or an actual Sendoso package. And I think that sometimes that's really tough to capture when you're outsourcing it. But I do think like if you're looking for like a mass play or just a lot of recognition around something that you're doing, I think that, you know, outsourcing it can cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. But like for us, we were really trying to drive rock solid, good companies into pipeline for us, like that's just not a place that we're at at this point because personalization is key. Yeah. And it's interesting because even as I said it, it's like if you're putting a puzzle together, you know, if you've got all the pieces of the puzzle, then you're good. Right. And so you don't, but there could be pieces of the puzzle that some of these companies could potentially help with. If you just need like hyper, hyper focused list building, like, you know, you just need to call like, every plumber in the San Francisco area who makes more than you know $100,000 a year, some crazy list that you don't want your internal team necessarily making, or you're putting on a conference. Like, you know, we're doing the conferences this year and, you know, we might need to call every sales development leader in the United States and just tell them that we have a conference, you know, and mm-hmm. it's not like, you know, I'm trying to, build, you know, $50,000 pipeline with a very specialized thing where the inside team would work better in that case and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. For something like getting the word out there about a conference, I think that there's a lot of value in outsourcing things like that. But, um, you know, again, like for the stage where the sales dev team is here at Sendoso, I think that we're much better suited, like sticking to what we know works, right? I mean, we we obviously drink our own champagne. We're heavy users of Sendoso internally. And that would be something that we definitely lost if we were to outsource any of the services. It's a really good point. So let me ask you this. As you're looking over, as much as you're comfortable sharing, like what are your biggest pain points as the senior director of this big program? I mean, are there two or three things that you're just like, God, if I could get rid of this, my life would be a lot easier? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, <laughs> hiring, right? Okay. Always is, is top of mind for anyone that's trying to build a team. I mean, we're growing rapidly. And that means that, you know, the headcount that I need to produce the numbers that, that I'm responsible for, that number is constantly growing. So it's just building that pipeline of qualified candidates, getting phone screens, bringing them in, getting offers out. And, you know, there's obviously a percentage that's going to attrit, right? Hopefully most of it's positive and internal. But, you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, I, I lose a lot of people to what I call, you know, good attrition. They're moving on within Sendoso, they're moving into other departments. There's been a ton of promotions, but it's still seats I have to backfill. So hiring is, is always going to be there, a company that's growing as rapidly as we are. But I would say that's also a good problem to have because it's better to be bringing people in faster than I can find them than having no thoughts about growing because the business doesn't need it. Um, yes. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, you know, when you're producing at a high level and you're bringing new people in and the needs are always changing, it, it's building that repeatable process and being able to make like strong data driven decisions. Process for us is a really, really big one. Like that's what I'm trying to make sure that we're arming the SDR team with is like a good, solid, repeatable process. And what's the formula for success? 
And I think that sometimes that's a tough one because you've got certain SDRs with different skill sets and this works for one, but not the other. And again, like the ask is changing and the team is growing and there's always, you know, we're bringing new leadership in. So building that like repeatable process that is set in stone and we know works day in and day out is, you know, one of the things that's like top of mind for me right now. We're just, we're at that point where we've got to a certain number of people now and, you know, we need to just get more and more and more laser focused. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the tools are, are out there to help, but you have to build like a custom car almost like with all these different parts because it's yep. customized to your business to be able to get the, the reports and be able to make data driven decisions. It's not like you could just open up a box and get the perfect thing. You have to make it yourself, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if it was, if it was plug and play, none of us would exist, right? If, if, if this was easy, if this was easy, none of us would be here. So, uh, well, I guess it's good then, you know, it gives you job security for a while, right? Yeah, ab- absolutely. <laughs> okay, and so what do you like about it? I mean, you know, you've been doing this for a number of years, super successful. Like, what gets you going about being involved in this industry? Yeah, so obviously, I genuinely believe in Sendosa, right? I mean, you you touched on earlier, like the right leadership, the right product market fit. We're not just selling like another pile of code. It's different. It's unique. It's fun. People want to hear about it. So like, that's kind of the why for like why I I came into Sendosa. Why I actually love what I do is the people, is the team that I've assembled here. I love the sales dev side of the house because I can positively impact a lot of careers and a lot of people's lives. I love nothing more than bringing somebody in who's new to sales or a complete career changer and watching them go from sitting in that first week of training with like that glossed over look on their face and you know they're thinking, I can't do this, <laughs> to a year later, we're making them an account executive or they're, you know, at a higher level of SDR. So, you know, I just love being able to have that positive impact on people's lives. And, you know, I love years down the road, right? People that I had, I had managed six, seven, 10 years ago, I'll bump into them at conferences. And every now and then they'll say, you know, like I learned so much from you. And like, I attribute so much to my success from the things you taught me. Like for me, like that makes me feel really good. It makes me know that I'm, I'm moving the needle. So that's definitely the why I stay in leadership and why I love the sales dev side of the house. Yeah, that's so interesting because, you know, a lot of people, even in the management side of sales development, they're just like, I'm just going to do this for a couple of years. And then I, I want to become a sales manager and because that's where the big money is and the glory. And, you know, just circling back to your initial point, I think as the department becomes recognized, respected, rewarded, that more and more people will understand. I mean, based on what you just said, there, there's so many benefits of staying in sales development and really developing yourself as this unicorn leader. Yeah. I mean, I think that the sales development space right now is growing so rapidly and there's a need for experienced leadership. So I think that if you do the right thing and take care of your people first, I mean, the money will take care of itself. I am like a firm, firm believer in like everybody inside of Sendoso has heard me say this a million times. My philosophy is manage to the people, not the number. If you manage to your team, the team will take care of the number. If you manage people to it if you just manage to a number it's very short-sighted and it's it's going to ultimately hurt you in the long run that is such a good point because it seems like with all the technology and the dashboards and everything it's really easy to get sucked into you know the conversion rates and all that stuff Mm -hmm. which is really important but at the end of the day it's still people that execute your strategy right yeah absolutely and you know the other thing is they're it's easy to look at, you know, across the floor and say, okay, you know, here's, here's the team. They all carry an individual quota. My overall number is X. And before you know it, these, these people become like walking, they become walking numbers. Like at the end of the day, like they're human beings. They're doing the best they can for their family. They're trying to make money. They're trying to build a career and, and move up for an organization. And I think that if they genuinely know that you care and you're genuinely on their side, you'll get so much more in return as far as effort and going that extra mile than you will by just sitting behind your keyboard, running Salesforce reports saying, we need X, we need X, go do this, go do that. Because instead of really getting on board and being a champion for you and the organization, 
they're probably talking to other people that will treat them a little bit better. Hundred percent. I can tell you that I don't. I don't have to push. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to push very hard. At the end of the month, we have a number to make because I think that the team is completely bought in. The team understands there's a mission here, and I think that they feel genuinely respected and cared about, and they have a lot of pride in getting this team, not just the individual, getting the team across the finish line. And that's one of the things that I'm most proud of that, that we've built here. That's amazing. This is great, great advice. I hope everyone's writing this down. I'm, I'm taking tons of notes. And you know, to that extent, what about your larger career? I know that you're very active in the AAISP community, American Association Inside Sales Professionals in Arizona. Yep. You know, how did you get involved in that and what does that entail for you? Yeah, so I was a member of AAISP for a number of years now, dating back to when I was in Boston with, with By Point Only. When I moved to Arizona, I instantly, you know, went on their website and looked to see what was around for chapters. And I realized they were in the process of relaunching the Phoenix chapter. So I immediately, you know, attended the first event they were having after I moved out here, started having some conversations, have made some great relationships with other really intelligent, really, really good sales leaders and sales folks out here in Scottsdale. I'm actually on their board for the Phoenix chapter. And we hosted last week, we hosted the winter meetup for the Phoenix chapter. So we had about 130, 140 people here in our office at Sendoso. We put on a panel, really, really successful event. But yeah, AISP for me has been great. I've met a lot of a lot of really, really good people that I now consider friends. Great opportunity to network with like-minded individuals and you know information sharing. So yeah, I mean, AISP has been great for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear just such great things. We have a very active chapter here in Silicon Valley, and I've made some amazing friends and just, you know, just opportunities galore in being involved. So definitely, if folks are not familiar with it, check out AISP in your area and, and get involved with it. Joe, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much for coming on the show. If folks want to get in touch with you and want to continue the conversation, what's the best way for you? Either LinkedIn or you can even feel free to email me, just joe at sendoso.com. Yeah, definitely. If you're in the <laughs> Scottsdale area and you're gritty, coachable, and hungry, right? It sounds like you want to get into the pipeline over at Sendoso. Yeah, we are definitely, team's growing. So now's the time. Struggle the iron pot. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Joe, thanks again. Thanks for coming on the Sales Development Podcast. And we'll see you at the next conference. Yeah, of course. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs> okay. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.